just a minute. James 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ, of the twelve tribes scattered abroad. Greeting. Now, in verse 2 he said, Brethren, count it all joy when you fall into a diverse temptation, knowing the trying of your faith worketh patience. God tries our faith. That's right. And we don't know how to try it, but He tries it. And it's, and it's usually not a joyous thing to have your faith tried. But it produces patience. And patience in verse number 4 has its perfect work. That perfect work is what God does to make you perfect and entire, wanting nothing. It's the working of grace in you that builds you and that makes you a stronger Christian. So you can't bypass these things. Your faith, when it's tried, as the Apostle Peter said, is more precious than of gold that perisheth. Yeah. Of trying of your faith proves you have faith. Why well, try something that doesn't exist? But when your faith is being tried, and you know it's being tried, and you don't want to quit, and you don't want to turn on God, then you know there's something real there. Amen. And then when you've come through it, you can look back on it and see where the hand of God has changed something about you. Every trial, I personally firmly believe this, every trial we ever go through will change us to a degree. Because He'll put His finger on something. He'll touch something in our lives that needs to be touched. And these things you can't do for yourself. You can't find them. You can't, you can't, you can't search your heart. A lot of times they, they lie hidden, dormant, or they lie obscured by something else, you know. In other words, a false problem. Satan, when he sees you begin to get serious about walking with God, he'll start pulling up stuff for you to confess that's, uh, that's uh, for the most part, uh, 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 frivolous, uh, surface stuff. Uh, he'll never let you get to the root of your problem. You see, you can confess frivolous surface stuff for the rest of your life and never get any help. It's when the Holy Spirit digs deep into your soul and takes you to the root of what's going on. A root of bitterness may be in there. Hurt, you know. And vengeance. It could be a lot of things. And they, they're dormant. You don't even see it. Don't even feel it. But it's there. And you wonder, why is it I just can't get a close walk with God? He'll let you know why if you listen to Him. But be careful with your enemy because every time you try to draw close to God, Satan will pull in there and he'll try to divert you and lie to you. But the Bible says in verse 6, Let a man ask in faith, not wavering. If you want wisdom, in other words, verse number 5, and wisdom has to do with patience, walking with God, understanding the will of the Lord, discerning spirits. These are things that are part of the Christian life. You're in a spiritual world. If you're a Christian, if you're a born-again believer, you have a spirit living in you. <laughs> Let me tell you this about spirits. Spirits draw spirits. And evil spirits for certain can draw a multitude of spirits. Legion had a, the Roman legion they say was somewhere around 7,000 men, somewhere give or take, uh, you know, in that area. That's a lot. The man in the tomb was legion, he said. We are legion. And uh, that's a lot of demons. That's a lot of evil spirits. And our problem today is that we are inundated. We are bombarded with spirits. The Lord says in 2 Timothy 1, 7, I have not given you the spirit of fear. Notice he didn't say, I haven't given you fear. He said, I haven't given you the spirit of fear. There's a spirit attached to fear. When you deal with the spirit, you're dealing with an intelligent creature. <clears throat> you can't tell it to leave, and you can't ask it to leave, and you can't pray about it leaving. You have to command it to leave. And when you command it to leave, you have to command it to leave by taking authority over it. You take authority over it in the name of Jesus. Now that all is contingent on whether you know Jesus. Because <laughs> if you don't know Him, that spirit will laugh at you. So it's a good trial of your faith and a trial of your, who you are. Because if you cannot cast them out of yourself, you certainly won't be able to cast them out of someone else. You say, well, what do you mean cast them out? You have spirits, everyone in this house tonight does. You're not possessed with them, but you can certainly be obsessed. obsessed. You can be harassed. You can be bothered. You can, they, can, they, can, they can come against you. And in the name of Jesus, you can cast them out of your life. You unclean spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, leave me. 
I don't belong to you. I belong to Jesus. I'm born again. I've been washed in the blood. I'm a child of God. You have no claim on me. You have no territory in me. You have no more place in me. In the name of Jesus, leave me. I take authority over you in the name of the Son of God. A lot of Baptists are scared to death to talk like that. I did that two days ago and that thing left me just like that. And it hadn't been back. I got up off of my knees and that spirit was gone. And that spirit had hounded me for quite a while. But I knew immediately that it was gone. For peace came into my presence. And I thank the Lord for it. Amen. They'll hound you. So he hadn't given you the spirit of fear. We need wisdom. We need to know how to deal with these things. Now, of course, you could get deeper into this thing tonight. I could tell you this, and a lot of people wouldn't agree with me, but I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. It talks about the spirit of infirmity. There are things that can be attached to your body, affect you physically, that can be a spiritual of nature, not caused by a disease or a problem like that. It's caused by a spirit. And when that spirit is gone, the infirmity is gone. It's so quiet in here. If I ever teach you anything that's not according to the Scripture, show it to me in the Bible, would you? Because I'm responsible. I have to give an account for your soul. And in 2013, folks, you live in a culture where probably eight out of ten people that you see every day are demon-possessed. Amen. And the vast majority of the people in this country who go to church houses on Sunday and worship, the vast majority of them are uh, either demon possessed or demon oppressed. And a good probably 60 to 70 percent of all the clergy standing in the pulpit in this nation are demon possessed. That's how bad off it is. That's how bad it is. And when you get on your knees and you start crying out to God, you go into a battle, you go into a spiritual battle. Satan doesn't bother with you as long as you're going with the tide. The average Christian, the average Christian fills their mind full of filth on a TV set week in, week out. They hear blasphemy into their ears constantly. They hear God's name taken in vain. Every kind of a filthy word that I don't need to get into detail tonight. It's constant, constant, constant diet of that. A constant diet of it. And then you wonder why you can't read your Bible and you can't pray. You can't have it both ways. When you see people healed by the power of God, they're healed by the power of God because of unction and anointing. That lady's healed because she came down here and was anointed by oil and you prayed for her. Amen. Amen. That's why she was healed. Because she obeyed what God laid on her heart to do. She did it and God raised her up. He is no respecter of persons. And I, I don't want to be mean with you tonight, but I'm going to tell you something. If you've got a problem, if you've got a physical problem, there's something in your body, you've got a cancer in your body, you've got a problem in your body or something like that, and something keeps telling you you don't need to be anointed, you don't need to go down there in front of those people, you don't need to have these people praying for you, that's not God. Amen. That is not God. That's the devil. He's lying to you. He's lying to you. I wouldn't hesitate to get on my knees, lay flat on my face, lay down on that floor right there. I wouldn't hesitate in a heartbeat to lay flat of my face on that floor and ask you to anoint me with oil and pray over me. Amen. Amen. I wouldn't hesitate. Not in a heartbeat. So, uh, ask in faith. Double-minded man, verse 8, is unstable. Verse 12, blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, he will receive the crown of life. The Apostle James gives three things, just like John does in 1 John, when he talks about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You don't, sign, you don't find the wording in, John, in, in James, but he said the same thing. For in verse number, in, in chapter number, uh, uh, chapter 1 and verse number 14, he said, Every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. That's the lust of the flesh. James chapter number 4 and, uh, and, and chapter number 4 and verse number 2. Here's the lust of the eyes. 
ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. <laughs> That's the lust of the eyes. Then in chapter number 4 and verse number 13, here's the pride of life. Look at verse 13, James 4. Go to now ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and vanisheth away. You ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. But now you rejoice in your boastings, all such rejoicing is evil. That's the pride of life. Yeah, right. Folks, you don't have any more control over your heartbeat and your breathing than you did your birth. <laughs> but how arrogant and proud we become. Just a few weeks ago, I listened to a woman. She's 70-something years old. None of you know her. She doesn't even live here. But she's 70-something years old. She started having heart problems very similar to what I had about a year ago. She started having heart problems. I'll never forget her words. I couldn't believe that I was having this problem. Did you hear that? A 70-something-year-old woman said, I couldn't believe that I was having heart problems. I thought to myself, why couldn't you believe it? You're a mortal creature. You're just, you're, you're here now, you're gone. You're living in a cocoon, folks. You're living with your head buried in the sand. Some of you are sitting here tonight making plans for a year from now, and you won't be here a year from now. If Satan ever lied to anybody, he built that, he put that lie into people. That's invincibility. I've noticed this invincible spirit. Well, you know, you can't talk to me like that, preacher. I'm in hell. I'm healthy. Yeah. A two thousand pound car can take care of all your health. Really? You should live like Lord willing. I'll be here tomorrow. Lord willing, I'll be here twenty four hours from now. Lord willing, I'll be here a year from now. Every day of my life. Every day of my life, when I get up the first thing in the morning, I say, Lord, I consecrate this life to Thee. I give You this life. My life is in Your hands. I'm alive because You let me live. I don't have any more, I don't more, any more count on tomorrow or next week than a man in the moon. I'm alive tonight because of the Lord God Almighty. But it's not intellectual, folks. It's in my heart. And when you get that in your heart, it'll change your life. It'll change you. And this is what he's talking about. The pride of life. The pride of life is as thick in the church as it can be. I know what I'm saying tonight's rough, but folks, I'm telling you the truth. Amen. These people come in here on Sunday morning, they come through here and breeze through here, and they, you know, they pass through Temple Baptist Church and, and flip God a little bit of time, and you don't see them again. You think they're really concerned about their soul and where they're going to go for eternity? Do you think they really believe that they might die tonight or tomorrow? You see what I mean? That's the pride of life. And I must honestly say, in, 19, in the last year, when, when this thing came on me, I'll make a confession to you tonight. I had lived 66 years in relatively perfect health. All those years I had lived in, in practic, almost perfect health. Never had anything major ever happen to me. Never had had surgery. None of that. And then all of a sudden, like a hammer out of the blue, I was slapped flat of my back with the ejection fraction of my heart at 19. People die with that kind of heart pumping. All of a sudden. Out of the clear blue. No warning whatsoever. And then while I'm down here, deep, deep down in the dark, his hand began to move on my soul. Not only did he touch my body, he touched my soul. And I came into this church and I told you when I, when, when I came back and was able to get back in the pulpit, I said, God's changed me. 
And I didn't realize how much of a change he'd made. He has changed me. I'd rather live in a dog house. I'd rather live in a dog house and ride a bicycle than to stand in a church and sell my soul for a lie. I've been to the dark place. I know what death looks like. I've been down there. And I know who my friend was. Glory to his name. I know who stood by my side. I know who raised me up. I know who was with me every day of my life. I know who I have believed. I know what it's like to be down there. I didn't get it from a book. I know what it's like. And gently and mercifully and graciously, he brought me back. And now I'm pushing wheelbarrows around and I'm picking up heavy weights and I'm carrying stuff around and walking as if nothing had ever happened to me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. And I know you've prayed for me, but folks, God did that. But it wasn't that long ago, just a few months ago, when I said to him, Lord, if I stay in this world, I'm going to preach. And I'm going to preach and nothing would suit me any better than if I'm up there in that pulpit preaching your word. If you want to take me, you take me while I'm up there preaching. I'd be the happiest thing that ever happened to me because that's all I care about. None of the rest of it matters. So when I said that to God, God said, now nah, preach, son, and I'm going to give you the strength to preach because that's what I called you to do. And so that's where I am. That's what I'm doing. So God told me the other day, and he just kept burning this in me. See that door over there going in my office? See that door? Can you see that? Look at this door over here. Do you know what's on the other side of that door? What? An office. But do you know what's in there? Do you know what's on the other side? Do you know if somebody's standing in there? Nobody in here knows that. You don't know if a man is standing behind that door with a 12-gauge shotgun. You don't know. Nobody does. Nobody has a clue what's on the other side of that door. The atheist, arrogant fool looks at you in the face and says there is no God, but he doesn't have us. He doesn't have a clue when his eyes shut and his heart stops what's waiting for him. He doesn't have a clue. But I've been blessed because I've been down through the valley. And I know what it's like. When David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, if you ever go down through it, you'll know what I'm talking about. It'll change you. So when I see what happened to this lady back here, poured my soul out for her, cried out to God, something came into my heart and said, she'll be okay. She'll be all right. She'll be okay. She'll be all right. She'll be all right. Would you do that, folks? Will you pray for each other like that? Would you? People in here got cancers. They got tumors in their body. They got high blood pressure. We got a sister out tonight over here that's got high blood pressure. His high blood pressure is just beating her to death. Brenda Presley, high blood pressure will kill you. High blood pressure is the silent killer. Would anybody in here get a burden for her? Get on your face at night, turn your TV off, turn off that filth, and get on your knees and climb in the hole somewhere and shut the door and get a hold of God and say, God, lower Brenda Presley's blood pressure. Lower it, Lord. God can lower that blood pressure. Lower her blood pressure, Lord. Lower her blood pressure. Lord, do that. Somebody got a cancer in their bodies, and a little lady right back here had can breast cancer, went over here to the hospital. They went in there, and I don't know what all they did, but they took some of it out, whatever. And she's just as precious as she can be. Tammy Campbell, sweetest thing you ever met in your life. Get on your knees. Get down in there. Get down and get down and shut the door. Get on. Get in the carpet. Bury your face in the dark. You and God. You and God. And say, Lord, take that cancer out of her body. Lord, raise her up. Heal her for your glory. Glorify yourself. In Jesus' name. Would you do that? Get in there and pray. And pray. You say, well, preacher, what about all my problems? Somebody else is praying for your problems. That's fellowship. Somebody else is praying for your problems. 
There's somebody spiritual enough in the church here to where they know and God lays it on their heart and they begin to cry out to God for you. I know people prayed for me. I know they did. And now I'm praying for other people. Crying out to God for them. Turn off the filth factory. Shut the sewer down. Take this, lay that thing down. The other day, this girl was walking across the street in New York City. <laughs> Struck instantly and killed right in her tracks. Walked right out in front of a truck. Isn't that ignorant? Stupidity. But the money merchants, money merchants could put a jammer in every car that would stop that radio. That's a radio signal. They could stop that signal. If you're driving an automobile, you know, and they don't want you texting, they could fix that. You know why they don't do it? The love of money is the root of all evil. Pray for it. Start James 5, and I'll close with this tonight. James 5. Look at this, James 5, verse 13, is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Now watch verse 16. This is the hard part. <laughs> Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. There's just some places in the Bible you don't care much for. If I live with Jehudi, I'll just rip that out. <laughs> I know what I'll do. I'll get, I'll, I'll get to technical and slick. I'll just make a new Bible. You know what he's saying? He's saying when a bunch of people know each other. You all know each other? <laughs> a church is a little community. And after a while, you get to know each other. You know? And that's why sometimes, I remember a few years ago, they said, this church here in Knoxville, Tennessee, said they were screaming at each other, the leadership of the church. They were on the stage in front of the people and they were literally screaming at each other. They went into a cuss fight. That's what they used to call it when I was a kid. They didn't hit each other. They hit each other with words. You know why? They had nothing but contempt for each other. You know why they had contempt for each other? Because they knew each other. You see what I mean? It was nothing but contempt. You know why? Because they knew that when they came before the people, the staff of that church, the staff, they'd meet during the week and prepare the, prepare the entertainment for the following Sunday, the drama and the music and all of that. You know, they have all that ready and, and they'd entertain the people. You know, they'd change their secular entertainment to a little religious entertainment on Sunday so they could go home feeling good because they, they had a good uplifting message that made them feel good and blah, blah. Well, they got sick of each other. And so when they got out on the stage, I don't know what kicked it off. Maybe a look. Sometimes that's all it takes is a look. They started screaming at each other. They went into a mad rage at each other. And what brought it on was contempt. And the Bible says, and not the Bible, but to the old axiom, familiarity breeds what? So how do you get that out? How do you work with each other? How do you fellowship with each other? You pray for fault. You pray for each other. And you don't try to act, you don't act like some, like some kind of a hypocrite. When you know you've got a problem and you know everybody else knows you've got a problem, Amen. confess it Amen. and say, would you pray for me? I need the grace of God in my life. I need grace. I need strength. I need help. Pray for me. And then you've disarmed them because once you ask people to pray for you and you're serious about it and they know you've got a problem and you're asking for prayer, then it's on them. If they don't pray for you, and if you've confessed it to God, He's forgiven it, and they can't throw it in your face, 
that's when you have strength and camaraderie. That's when you have fellowship with each other. And that's when you have a burden and a problem and you have a sickness. You have a problem in your home. You got a drunken husband or a wife running off with another man. Your children are out here all night long. Every kind of thing in the world's happening. You got people that will pray for you and with you. Don't be ashamed because you got black sheep in your family. Everybody's got black sheep in the family. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay. I'll be very brief. You were talking about confessing your thoughts one to another. Yeah. Remember last week I told you I came up there and you prayed for me over there. Yes, sir. I told you Sunday that God did something. Yes, sir. He, you well, told me that. Tell, let me tell you right. how God did something for me. My friend Travis Patrick up in Ohio, Travis uh, been faithful uh, to post videos from the church. He's the one, he's got a the Hellfire Sermon on the internet, over 50,000 views. I mean, God has really used this young man. He and I are really good friends. Well, Travis called me last Wednesday, and uh, he had read a message by a Puritan preacher, a Calvinist, and a lot of them are good saved men, but they think things to death, man. And I mean, they can take it to the umpteenth degree and bring condemnation on people, something awful. Well, Travis and his wife, he had read this, this uh, sermon to his wife, and he texted me the link, and, and I read the, the uh, sermon as well. And then he called me while I was on my way to church, and he told me this. He said, Brother, we are feeling condemned. He said, I know I'm saved, and my wife knows that she's saved, but but uh, something is just eating us up. It's just eating us alive. He said, ever since I was 15 years old, I've uh, dipped snuff and chewed tobacco. And I know it's wrong, and, and uh, I can't quit. I just can't quit. What do you think about that? And I said, well, brother, first of all, let me tell you this. Jesus loves you. He loves you. And, and he knows what you're going through. He was tempted in all points like as we are yet without sin. I don't mean ever sin in particular, but in all points like we are. So he understands what that is. And he's able to stand by you and help you through that. And now you're asking me what I think about your, your confession to me. Well, let me make one to you. I've been saved for almost 36 years and off and on through that 36 years and at the present time, I have dipped snuff and I hated it. I hated everything about it. I was ashamed, I was embarrassed. I, I wished that I could quit, but I simply could not quit. And I told him, I said, brother, I know exactly what you're going through and I hate it. And I wish that I could say right now that I'll never do it again, but I know I'd just be lying because I don't have the strength. I have no power. I got no ability within myself to deliver me from that habit. I came in here to the church and a preacher caught me going out and he said, brother, I wanna pray for you. And he took me by the hand and he started praying. He was praying about my knee. But you notice what it said in James. It said, uh, confess your faults one for another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. Well, brother, he healed me of that fault. Amen. Last Wednesday night, God did something in me. And I mean, it's like, I still, I'm, I, I, I don't know what to say. I got the same amount of, you know, my nerves or all that, but, but I don't have to have that. I don't need that. I don't want that. God knows that, that how much I hate that. And because I humbled myself to this stranger who lives hundreds of miles away and told him, say, brother, I've got the same problem. God graciously delivered me from it. And God did that. I'm telling you, man. You, my wife, can she, she can tell you, I don't have the willpower of an ant. 
I'm telling, man, I mean, there ain't a, I can't withhold anything from me that my heart desires. It's all got to be by God's grace, and God did that. Because I confessed my faults to somebody. I just, I knew it. As soon as I did it and he prayed for me here, I knew that that was what had happened, and he just confirmed it tonight. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. Bear you one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. I want to thank all of you who prayed for me over the years and who pray for me still. Thank you. God bless you. I love you so much. And I pray that God will make me into something that will make it worthwhile the time you spend on your knees for me. God bless you, brother. The Lord doesn't have to tell me what we're praying for or you. As long as your heart's right and you want to pray and you want to help somebody, uh, you minister grace, ministered grace to Him. And everything has to come by grace. If it doesn't come by grace, well, you're beating your, you know, you're just beating your head into the wall. Amen. 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 God has changed my ministry. I mean, I have a desire, a burning desire to preach and teach, but also minister, minister, minister. And uh, just uh, God will he'll take care of it when it and where and so forth. But uh, that's where we fail. That's where the Baptists fail. They failed. And I've been a Baptist ever since I've been born again. They're good people. They're good people. But they failed because they turned away from the very root and source of what we're about. And that's the unction and the anointing of God. And without that, we can't do anything. Yes, sir. Brother Pick. Yes, sir. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. I know a lot of people. I pray for your wife, and I know a lot of other people are praying for your wife, brother. <coughs> yes, amen. Amen. Yes, ma'am. Can I confess something? The Lord is laid out my heart. All right. Um, several weeks back, before I ever had any heart problems, uh, I was at work. 